Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is good that we've come and gathered that we might worship God together today. This truly is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome all of you as we've come and gathered together for worship this morning, as well as including those here in the sanctuary, as well as those online, as together we create this unique and wonderful community of faith to lift our hearts and minds and voices in praise to God and what a gift it is that we have opportunity to do so together today. I do hope that you will find an opportunity to greet one another by name following this service today. One of the ways in which we do that is with the friendship pads. I invite you to fill those out if you're here in the sanctuary or find that online way to do so on the website if you're watching us online. Uh, as you pass those pads down and pass them back, please do include your name, your address, maybe a phone number, email, especially if you're visiting with us so that we might be in touch with you in this week that is ahead to share a word of, of welcome. For we are truly grateful that you are here. And if you are looking for a church home, I do hope that you will find unity to be a place of worship and service that God might be calling you to be a part of. If that's the case, you can speak with me or with um, Molly or Mark or someone else sitting near you that we might follow up on that interest and answer any questions that you might have. If you are interested in learning more about our life and ministry together, I also want to invite you to come to the Fellowship Hall at 10 o'clock today following this service for uh, a Welcome to Unity coffee. It's an informal time. Ask questions, meet some people, and, and have a chance just to learn a little more about our life and our ministry together. As we gather for worship this morning, the rose here on the uh, communion table is in honor of Hudson Tyler Borland, who was born on November the 3rd to Ellen and Tyler Borland. Uh, proud big sister is Sutton, and proud grandparents are Pam and Peter Bright, and we celebrate and rejoice with them today. This morning, after the 11 o'clock service, I want to also invite you to come and uh, join in the fellowship hall as we assemble cleanup uh, buckets for those experiencing natural disasters. Uh, the last time we did so was with our children in the spring, and all of those buckets have been sent out to those who found themselves uh, victims of the most recent hurricanes, including many buckets that were sent to Montreat. So the warehouse is about empty, and it's time for us to assemble some more. So come and join us following the 11 o'clock service so around noon in the fellowship hall to be a part of that experience together that's for everyone everyone's invited to come and be a part of that time uh, this week we're also hosting family promise uh, families experiencing homelessness uh, we are still looking for a few overnight hosts uh, one on wednesday and two on saturday so if you're interested and available in coming and sleeping here at the church it's a pretty easy job uh, come and sign and sign up with danny vaughn about that uh, children's choirs also begin again this afternoon, so please join us for those as well. Uh, thanks to all who have expressed interest in being a part of hurricane uh, relief, including work trips to affected areas. Uh, Stuart Nix and Bob Edwards went yesterday to, uh, to Mitchell County. We're continuing to look for future opportunities as well. Uh, there is a link to a form in the bulletin if you'd like to express your interest in being a part of those trips. And um, otherwise, just reach out to me to make sure we can get you on the list. Sometimes those uh, needs uh, come up really quickly. And so being able to, to have that list ready to go uh, might help you to be a part of it as well. Looking ahead, I do hope that you'll be a part of uh, the men's breakfast on Tuesday. We'll also have the blood drive on Tuesday as well. Um, youth spring and summer trip registration is open, so I draw your attention there. And also looking all the way to, to December, uh, the All Church Advent Workshop is on that Sunday, December 1st, and the Tony Daler Christmas Auction, Monday, December the 2nd. Let's keep all these things in mind, the many ways in which God calls us to live and serve together as we begin our time of worship this morning. I invite you to stand as you are able as we join in our call to worship together. As we gather for worship, let us offer praise to God. As, as we, we join, join voices, voices and hearts, we, we learn the importance of each one of us. As we find unity in the wider body of Christ, let us worship the living God.
may be seated. Beloved, as we come to this font each week, we are reminded that God meets us here. A God who is ready to forgive, who is gracious and merciful, who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Trusting in these truths, let us now come to God with the truths of our lives as we join in our confession together, first out loud and then silently. Let us pray. Gracious God, you bless us with all we need, and yet we have worked without letting you work in us. We have not let you watch over us, we perversely cherish our busy, busy days. By your very present spirit, give us the freedom to let you work in us, to build up your house, to let you care for us, to let you fill our days, that we may live not in the strength of our own hands, but in the strength that comes from life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ, who is our high priest, made himself a sacrifice once and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Siblings in Christ, the news is good and it is for you. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. seated. My friends, this is certainly a day of great celebration and joy as we have opportunity to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. So at this time, let me invite the Hans family to come forward, as well as Dave Johnson, who serves not only as a representative of the session, but also grandfather today to be a part of this time. I hope that you will find in your bulletin the places and ways that you'll be a part of this service of baptism as well. Hear these words of Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and are joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present <laughs> Boston Posey, Rowan Davis and Indigo Christina, <laughs> sons and daughters of Sabrina and Matthew Hines, to receive the sacrament of, of baptism. Sabrina and Matthew, as you bring your children for baptism today, I ask you these questions. Uh, first, do you desire that uh, Boston, Rowan, and Indy be baptized? Do you? Do. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ, accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? We do. 
Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to Boston, Rowan, and Indy? Do you? Do we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Boston, Rowan, and Indy by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of Christ's church? If so, please respond, we do. We, we do. do. I now invite you to stand as you are able as we all join in words of affirmation from a declaration of faith found in your bulletin. We believe God acts by the Spirit in baptism, calling us by name to be His, cleansing us from corruption, giving us new life, setting us in the fellowship of believers. Baptism reminds us that God loves us long before we can love God, and that faith and repentance are necessary as our response to God's love. Though we are baptized but once, our response should continue and deepen throughout life. Amen. You may be seated. Let us join in prayer together. We give you thanks, eternal God, for, your nourish, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing rebirth. We praise you that in baptism you give us your Holy Spirit, who teaches us and leads us into all truth. Gracious God, pour out your Spirit upon Boston, Rowan, and Indy, upon us and upon this water, that this font may be your womb of new birth. Strengthen us all to serve you with joy until that day when you make all things new. Amen. All right, Boston, you ready? Boston Posey, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Defend, O Lord, your servant Boston with your heavenly grace, that he may continue yours forever, and daily increase in your Holy Spirit more and more, till he comes to your everlasting kingdom. Boston, you are a child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Amen. Rowan Davis, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Defend, O Lord, your servant Rowan with your heavenly grace that he may continue yours forever and daily increase in your Holy Spirit more and more till he comes to your everlasting kingdom. Rowan, you are a child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Indigo Christina, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Defend, O Lord, your servant Indy, with your heavenly grace, that she may continue yours forever and daily increase in your Holy Spirit more and more until she comes into your everlasting kingdom. Amen. Indy, you are a child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Through baptism, God has affirmed Boston, Rowan, and Indy as members of this community of faith and has received them into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I charge you, the people of this congregation, 
friends and family to love and support Sabrina and Matthew, assisting them in nurturing of Boston, Rowan, and Indy. With joy, joy and thanksgiving, thanksgiving we, welcome we welcome Boston, Boston Rowan, and Indy into Christ Church, for we are all one in Christ. We promise to love, encourage, and support you, Sabrina and Matthew, and we promise to share the good news of the gospel with Boston, Rowan, and Indy. This certainly is a day of great joy and celebration, and as we have a chance to sing together, Jesus Loves Me, we're going to walk through the congregation and introduce our uh, new members here to our family of faith, to their aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, grandparents in the church. truly is a day of great joy for your family, for your church family, and to help you remember and to tell the story of this day, we have uh, chrismons for your trees, as well as baptism certificates uh, for you as well. You're, you're welcome. God bless you all. Thank you very much. First scripture reading this morning it comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again, as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. At this time, let me invite our young friends and children to come and to spend a few moments together here on the steps. If you are watching from home, I hope that you'll draw near the screen that you might be a part of this special time together as well.
Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all today? Good. It is good to see you. Thank you so much for being here, being a part of worship, because worship is always so much better when you are here and are part of it. So thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Well, good. You know, um, you know, last week we talked about saints, right? And, um, and then the Panthers went and beat the saints um, in the football game. So, so someone told me maybe today, since the Panthers are playing the Giants, that we should talk about David and Goliath, right? So, but, but I decided we weren't going to do that, okay? No, we we're just going to talk about something else. And, and I was thinking this morning that we just had a chance to see something really special, right? We just got a chance to see a baptism for Boston and Rowan and for Indy, right? What a great gift that is. And what was helping me to remember and think about the ways in which baptism connects all of us together, right? Because baptism isn't just for people who are really little, right, that you can carry in your arms. It's not just for people who are really old, right? Baptism isn't just for people who have blonde hair or people who have brown hair or people who have gray hair, right? Baptism is for everyone because God loves each and every one of us and claims us as God's own. We've been children of God long before we ever had a chance to say yes to God. God had already said yes to us. And so baptism is one of those ways that we remember that, one of the ways in which we see and, and have a chance to experience it that we all get a chance to be a part of this, this uh, thing called the church, this big family, family of God. And that's something very special that we need to remember and hold on to. And the promises that we make to help care for each other and to love each other and help each other to learn about God, that's something that all of us make as well, from the very youngest to the very oldest. It all die, ties us together in God's great love that we might be the church together. Is that something y'all can remember for me this week? All right. Well, good. Well, let's remember that as we pray together. All right. I'll pray a little bit and y'all can repeat after me. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God uh, we thank you, we thank you for, your love, for your great love and the gift of baptism that reminds us all are a part of your family. Amen. All right, thank you all so much for coming up today. If you are first grade and under and headed to children and worship or nursery, you can head out these doors or back to your seats. We're going to surround you with our song of blessing. Second scripture reading for this morning comes from the songbook of Israel, the Psalms. Today we will read Psalm 127. Now, this psalm appears to be more of an odd collection of wisdom sayings than a coherent song, but it does remind us of our ultimate dependence upon God and also our role in God's work in the world today. So let us hear this word of God. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many of you will recognize that I am generally a preacher who seeks to account for the whole of a particular scriptural text, but 
as this psalm does seem more proverbial, this morning I want to focus just on the opening lines of the psalm. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And I want to begin with a story, perhaps one that you've heard before. There was once a very successful man who made a lot of money in his life and in his business, and he decided that he wanted to take a trip around the world. And so just before he left, he asked his longtime assistant if he would supervise the building of a house. The man wanted no money spared on the construction, the finest of everything, telling the assistant that he would be gone for about a year and he expected the house to be finished by the time he returned. Well, the man left on his trip. The assistant began his work. He started asking different builders how much it would cost to complete the house that his boss had in mind. And he quickly realized that if he used materials that were not quite the best and hired workers who were not careful in their job, that he could build the house more cheaply and he would have money left over. And when he realized this, he came up with a scheme to request money from the company to pay for the best of everything, but to actually hire people and use materials that were far cheaper. And he himself would keep the difference. And that is what he did. Well, just before the boss returned, the house was finished. On the surface, it looked okay. But if you examine closely, you could see that everything was not exactly right. It was not the best by far. But still, the assistant stood proudly at the end of the driveway with the keys to the house so that he could meet the boss when he arrived to inspect his new home. And the boss pulled up in his car. He stopped at the end of the driveway. He looked out his window at the house and he smiled. And then he said, you know, while I was away, I met some people who wanted to buy my company. And they offered me more money than I thought the business was worth. And since I was having such a great time traveling, I decided that I should sell and continue seeing the world. So I don't need this house after all. But you have been my faithful assistant for so many years, so I want to do something for you. The house which you just built for me, I am giving to you. Keep the keys. The house is yours. And with a wave of his hand, he drove away. The assistant looked at the house that he had built, and he thought to himself, if only I had known I was building the house for me, I would have done it all differently. I really would have spared no expense. I would have hired the best workers, used the best materials. Now I'm left with a poorly built home, and it is mine. My friends, what kind of house are we building here at Unity Presbyterian Church? What kind of community are we crafting in Fort Mill and in this nation? We ponder those questions. Again, Psalm 127 reminds us, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And I will admit that that verse gives me some hope. It reminds us about the sovereignty of God. Yes, we know that the Lord is building the house on the good days and on the bad days, on the days when the plans seem clear and progress is being made, on the days when we seem to be doing more demolition than construction, we can trust that the Lord is building the kingdom of God. We know that God is in control. We can trust that the future is in God's hands. So whatever emotions, elation, or despair that we are feeling in this particular week, take a deep breath and believe. Yes, this verse provides me, from, provides me some hope, but it also does not relieve us of the responsibility that is ours. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. The Lord builds the house, but the labor of building is done with our hands and our feet. 
My friends, scripture is consistent from beginning to end, from the vocation given on the sixth day of creation in Genesis to God's call to Abraham that all the families of the earth might be blessed through him, to prophets and poets and kings, to even foreign rulers like Cyrus, to disciples and apostles sent to every corner of the earth, It is God's intention and plan to build the house, to build the kingdom of God, and to do so through obedient and faithful human beings. But so often, despite this lofty call, we turn into that master's assistant, deciding that poor construction, cutting corners, and pocketing the money is the better way, as opposed to following the Lord's instruction to build a home of excellence. Throughout history, we have seen poor construction through putting too much faith and trust in political powers and officials. We'll wrestle with that in a future week. We've also seen the opposite response with the cost coveting of limiting our engagement with the world. I'm sure you have heard, let's just keep the church and politics separate. Let's not worry about what's happening out there. Let's just focus on Jesus and getting people to heaven. But that too is not a faithful choice. As N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd write in their book, Jesus and the Powers, there is no opt out for us if we are committed to Jesus as Lord And the way that lordship becomes a part of life lived in community with others. To be clear, this is not about a Christian takeover. It's about a Christian testimony in an age of troubles, terror, tyranny, and tragedy. They say the reason for that is simple, the kingdom of God. Precisely because we believe Jesus is king and his kingly power is operative among us, we cannot retreat into the attic of spiritual affairs. Not when there is a gospel to proclaim and a hurting world crying out for healing and hope. My friends, while it is absolutely true and essential for us to remember that only God can build the kingdom of God, only God can bring the kingdom to fruition, only God can bring the healing and the wholeness that our world so desperately needs, it is also absolutely true and essential that we are called to build for God's kingdom. We are called to find those places where God is at work and to do our part. We are called to find the moments where grace breaks through and to amplify them. No matter who our elected officials might be, the church is called to this community work, to this political work. And that was true on Monday, it was true on Tuesday, it was true on Wednesday, it was true today. Again, N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd say, the gospel calls us to believe in Jesus Christ, to belong to the church, and to build for the kingdom. If we perform this role properly, we will walk in the way of the cross and build right under Caesar's nose things that challenge the edifices of totalitarian regimes, that show forth the beauty of God's new creation that demonstrate that there is a different way to be human, liberated from the lusts of pleasure and power, attaining a genuine human life by conforming to the image of the Son of God. We are to be a kingdom of priests and a royal priesthood in a world savaged by sin, ravaged by death, distraught with despair, and destroyed by despots. And so this morning, we set our hearts and our minds, our hands and our feet to begin once again. Even and especially when the task seems great, our small part in this kingdom building work matters. Perhaps you've heard another story of a traveler who came to France to see the great cathedral that was being built there. He arrived at the end of the day, and he went to the site just as the workers were leaving to go back home. 
And he asked one man covered in dust what he did there. And the man responded that he was a stonemason. He spent his days carving rocks. Another man, when asked, said he was a glass blower who spent his days making slabs of colored glass. Still another workman replied that he was a blacksmith who pounded iron for a living. Wandering into the deepening gloom of the unfinished edifice, the traveler came upon an older man armed with a broom. He was sweeping up the stone chips and the wood shavings and the glass shards. What are you doing? The traveler asked. The man paused, leaning on his broom, looking up at the brilliant windows, the soaring archer arches, and replied, Me? I'm building a cathedral for the glory of Almighty God. Yes, my friends, the Lord builds the house, but the work we do matters. We have an opportunity to build a house, a community, a world that we will live in and that we will pass on to the generations that follow. So how will you begin? How will I begin? Perhaps some final words from N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd will encourage us all. Whatever your age, ableness, sex, education, limitations, fears, stage of life, or self-doubts, you have something to contribute to the coming kingdom. Why else is the Spirit given other than to convict us, to inspire us, and to empower us to do what we would ordinarily not be able to do ourselves? So let your heart be burdened by the needs you see around you. Let your mind be haunted by a great missionary task that remains unfinished. Let your conscience be pricked by a grave injustice that goes on blighting the land. And then as far as you are able in your season of life, pick one ministry in your church to help and one cause to partner with. Look around. We live in interesting times, dire times, dangerous times, tragic and terrible times. What will you do with your life? The world needs kingdom-minded Christians now more than ever. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Friends, we begin our response to God's word read and proclaimed by gathering as God's people into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, we come before you today as thirsty people. We thirst for that foundation, that rock upon which your church is built. We thirst for your touch of grace, of hope, of forgiveness, of promise. We give you thanks that you do not leave us alone in our times of thirst and struggle, for it is your spirit that comforts us in our distress and goads us to action when our commitment falters. As we approach Veterans Day, Lord God, we are ever mindful of the cost paid for liberty we possess. We ask you to bless the members of our armed forces, bless them for their unselfish service, bless them abundantly for the hardships they have faced and the sacrifices they have made. We also pray this day for our nation. We lift up all the issues and frustrations that affect the citizens of this country following Tuesday's election day. 
We pray you would give us the ability to listen to each other and hear, really hear, the concerns that we all have. Let sensibility, genuine compassion, and empathy rise in the hearts of people in this nation. Remind us, O oh God, that we are a nation under God made up of people from all different nationalities and backgrounds, which is the beauty of our country. Help us realize that loving our country is not about flag waving, but about loving our neighbor as ourselves. Remind us in these days, O oh God, what you have taught us, that everyone is our neighbor, which means we are to love everyone as ourselves. That's an enormous responsibility. And we pray that we as your people will lead the way in doing that. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray for ourselves because we are the ones who can lead the transformation of this nation. We carry in our hearts the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let this message go beyond our hearts and flow into our actions and into our speech. Help us not to get sucked into the temporary nature of elections and surrender to fear and anger and division. Rather, may we focus on the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. Help us to represent you well so that we would bring joy to your heart as your children. We continue to pray as your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is more blessed to give than to receive.
pray. Holy God, these offerings are only a portion of all that you have given us. We gratefully present these gifts and entrust them to your work in the world. May our gifts share the good news of the gospel with those who are in need. May these gifts help unburden those with heaviest loads. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
friends, as we go forth from this place, as our service of worship comes to an end, may our lives of worship and service begin anew. For the Lord builds the house and the work we do building for the kingdom of God matters. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.